In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. In principio et nunc et semper et in saecula saeculorum. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we're talking about separation of church and state uh, on this one, which is uh, it's, it's the Catholic response to the political thing. And I think something that is helpful for us to start is the idea of separation in church, of, uh, the separation of church and state. What a thoroughly odd Catholic concept. It's not really a Catholic idea. And I'd like to read something to you. This is an encyclical. If you're take, for those of you who are taking notes, I would suggest you write this down. Almost no one's ever heard of this encyclical. But it's a tremendous, tremendous encyclical. It's by Pope St. Pius X, and he issued it on February 11th. For those of you who are uh, uh, aware of that date, this Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, uh, he issued it on February 11th, 1906, and it was a hundred years after the uh, concordat between France and the Holy See uh, had been uh, had been signed, fell apart afterwards. And the idea was promulgated that the church and the state should be separate. Now, that idea was never even present in the pagan mind back in, you know, 2,000 years earlier. The idea of somehow decoupling religion, regardless if the religion for the moment was a pagan worshiping a, you know, big wooden statue or whatever, is not the point. The point is that in your mind, you didn't separate what was essentially morality from governing. That's not a Catholic concept. And as the sort of refuse of the Protestant revolt swept over Europe and uh, caused all kinds of uh, chaos and nations, various nations and governing uh, institutions started choosing up sides between Catholicism and Protestantism, uh, you know, just a whole myriad of unforeseen problems came tumbling out. Uh, in France, uh, the church suffered mightily immediately, of course, in the, uh, the French Revolution, but they set up this concordant, and it was, okay, so the church is going to live here, and the uh, state is going to live there, and there'll be some relationship between the two, and of course, that's what spilled over here into the United States. You know, separation of church and state is not, that was just a phrase that Thomas Jefferson used in a letter. That's not some, you know, American governing principle, but now you hear it left and right, all oh, separation of church and state. Well, when you separate two entities, and both of them believe that they have a claim to leadership, you don't have a cooperation, you now have a competition. And one of them's going to win that place, that sort of primary place. And I have to tell you in the American culture now who's winning that. But so I'd like to, I just highlighted a few things here I'd like you to hear. He's speaking about the idea, Pope St. Pius X is speaking about the idea of separation of church and state. This encyclical uh, is vehementor nos. It's V E H E M E. N T E R, vehementer nos. Uh, we're angry, <laughs> if you were to sum it up. So, on this concept, he says, it is disastrous to society as it is to religion, separation of church and state. Uh, this will bring about dreadful blows aimed from time to time by the public authority at religion. You have seen the sanctity, he's writing this to the church in France. You have seen the sanctity and the inviability of Christian marriage outraged by legislative acts in formal contradiction with them. I saw that. It jumped out at me. Some of you know uh, that both Matthew and I were at the Supreme Court uh, June 26th, and we saw what happened there. Uh, the law ordaining public prayers at the beginning of each parliamentary session will be abolished the religious character effaced from the judicial oath, religion banished from the courts, the schools, the military, in a word, from all public establishments. Does this sound familiar? 
The enemies of religion have succeeded at last in effecting by violence what they have long desired in defiance of your rights as a Catholic nation. That the state, and this is the heart of it, that the state must be separated from the church is a thesis absolutely false, a most pernicious error, based as it is on the principle that the state must not recognize any religious cult. It is in the first place guilty of a great injustice to God, for the creator of man is also the founder of human societies and preserves their existence as he preserves our own. We owe him, therefore, not only a private cult, but a public and social worship to honor him. Besides, this thesis is an obvious negation of the supernatural order. It limits the action of the state to the pursuit of public prosperity during this life only. But as the present order of things is temporary and subordinated to the conquest of man's supreme and absolute welfare, it follows that the civil power must not only place no obstacle in the way of this conquest, but must aid us in affecting it. This thesis inflicts great injury on society itself, for it cannot either prosper or last long when due place is not left for religion. And then he goes on and quotes Pope Leo XIII, who says, between them, church and state, there must necessarily be a suitable union, which may not improperly be compared with that existing between body and soul. Human societies cannot, without becoming criminal, act as if God did not exist or refuse to concern themselves with religion as though it were something foreign to them or of no purpose to them. Those last two sections, I think, follow wonderfully on what B. Michael was talking about. You know, you get to certain stages because of things that happened before those stages. We know that just from our everyday common experience in life. So when a culture, when a society says we're going to just separate these two things, well, they're in competition. That's why before they were in cooperation. When church and state come together and work effectively, they are in cooperation with each other. I'm talking about the Catholic Church, not like the Church of England or you know some other false religion. And when they're working together, no, you don't. The Pope doesn't have to sign off on like where the manhole covers are going. <laughs> it's not his particular role. But the state absolutely should be answering to the church if you say you're going to marry two men or two women together to each other. So what do we as Catholics do? Well, I think the first thing many Catholics have in their mind, in America particularly, is we have in our mind, you know, there was this great kind of marriage between, you know, the question of the 1950s, and then, you know, can you be a good Catholic and a good American? Again, flowing out of what E. Michael talked about in his last talk. That was a big sort of challenge. And so the church sort of bought into this concept, uh, had bought in it, into it actually with many of its leaders prior to that. They wanted a place at the table. Catholic leaders, predominantly Irish, wanted a place at the table, hierarchy. They wanted to be accepted here in America. Now think back you know, to the 1950s. You have Bishop Sheen on TV. Uh, you have... Uh, going my way, the bells of St. Mary's, Father Bing Crosby. Uh, you have in the great sort of social uh, view of everything, Catholics are kind of cool. There's something sort of interesting out there about them. Those were the movies that Hollywood is making. You have the Catholic League for Decency rating movies saying, nope, can't go. And you know, Hollywood, many of the studios in Hollywood were terrified that the Catholic Decency League would say, oh, no, that, that movie, no, no, it's not good enough. And so you think about that. I mean, my father lives with me. He's 86 years old. All of that is in his living memory. He remembers sitting down, watching Bishop Sheen and turning off Milton Berle. He didn't know what a remote was, <laughs> but he knew what the dial was. And, you know, there were the... the there's one set of movies, and if any of you have ever seen The Trouble with Angels, Rosalind Russell was the principal, Haley Mills was the girl's you know, wonderful, cute, little lighthearted movie, and at the end, Haley Mills goes on to be a nun. That was, when that movie was done, the first one, they came back with a sequel in, I think it was six years later, I think, and the difference between those two movies really was kind of, I guess you could look at it as a microcosm and say, wow, this is so different. Over here, there were a couple of these wonderful scenes 
in the movie, you know, Haley Mills is this, you know, very spunky, you know, girls uh, prep boarding school thing. And she gets into trouble. And so she gets uh, detention, I guess you'd call it. And she's kind of creeping around in the convent, looking at all the nuns in these very prayerful moments. She's hiding behind one of the pillars in their chapel, listening to them sing uh, Adeste Fidelis. And she's, and you can see kind of like the awe and the like strike on her face of, wow, this is, and she looks out the window one night. She can't stand Mother Superior. Mother Superior is a grouchy old, you know, thing. Whatever. And she sees her walking around outside in the cold with her habit on and her big hood. And she puts a little piece of bread up behind, in the hood of a statue of St. Francis uh, for the birds. And she, again, you see that kind of like, wow, there's something more here. There's something transcendent here. And there's a number of scenes like that in the movie. And so much so that at the end of the movie, you find out that she's going to go into the convent. The second movie doesn't have any of those types of scenes in it. I can't remember what it's called, but it's, I remember the name of it, but it's very obvious. It's, it's a sequel to it. Many of the same characters are in it. It doesn't have anything like that in it. And that's in the 1960s. And so there's this like rupture in the minds of uh, Catholics. And you look around, you see the whole, you know, all the changes after Vatican II, which Vatican II didn't say to do, and uh, any of them, really. And uh, you see all of this. And so Catholics have this sense in the 50s, certainly in the 60s, that our role is to uh, enmesh ourselves in the culture Prior to that, it was, we are different. Now it's, we want to be like you. And the confusion that happens after Vatican II sort of baptizes that idea in people's minds. And so we don't want to talk about those Protestants over there anymore. We just want to talk about things we have in common. And, uh, and so this great push begins, or understanding begins. It's a, it's a movement where people are... Catholics are trading away the faith in the hopes of becoming more American. And it was a hope that's realized. You look at any social demographic of anything today in the United States, and Catholics do whatever the evil is you're talking about at pretty much the same rate. Obama's the president because 54% of Catholics voted for Obama. Uh, and so, too, did, by estimates of bishops, about 54% of the bishops voted for him also. And let me give you a uh, little note here. This is a public piece of information uh, because he said it. Uh, bishop Tobin, who's the Bishop of Providence, Rhode Island, a generally good guy, revealed after the 2012 election, he came out publicly and said in a newspaper interview uh, that uh, he was going to switch parties and begin voting Republican. That's a bishop in 2000, after the 2012 election. Do the math on that for a moment. Here's a bishop who twice voted for Obama. Okay, did he have buyer's remorse after 2012? Yeah, sure. But the point is he voted for him. And Bishop Tobin's a, you know, rather orthodox bishop as far as, you know, he's not, you know, proposing gay marriages and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So what's going on? Why is there this sort of notion in Catholic minds that a way to sort of accomplish change in the culture is through the political process? How many people here voted for Ronald Reagan at least once? Keep your hands up. OK. I want you to all see that. Ronald Reagan gave you Sandra Day O'Connor. Sandra Day O'Connor gave you the pro-abortion ruling in Casey versus Planned Parenthood in the 5-4 vote split. You voted for Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan gave you Anthony Kennedy. Anthony Kennedy gave you gay marriage. You got to understand that this idea it kind of boils my blood a little bit. This is personal things, nothing to do with the church. But when I see an American flag in the sanctuary of a Catholic church in the United States, I get my back up. 
because there is this sense, not that that doesn't happen in Europe and other parts of the world also, but so many Americans, because we came over here in these waves of immigrants, we came over here with this understanding that we just got to belong. We got to belong. We got to be accepted. And we moved into a Protestant majority uh, that was... Uh, whose thinking was manipulated, easily manipulated, as E. Michael can tell you in any one of his 47,000 pages. Is that what it is out there? <laughs> That's just half of them. <laughs> this whole thing is manipulated by this great conspiracy, which is, of course, you know, different individuals come into history, and they are manipulated, but they're manipulated by the satanic. They're manipulated by the diabolical. If you lose sight, as a faithful Catholic, if you lose sight, ever lose sight, of the, of the truth of the matter, that this is Satan versus the church, you're personally going to lose. You can never lose that oversight. That's what it is. Does Satan make various use of you know, circumstances and things that unfold in front of his eyes also? Well, sure he does. He doesn't know the future, but he's smarter than any human being and he understands that if a certain set of uh, things are put into arrangement, there's a probable outcome, a very likely outcome that X, Y, and Z are going to happen. That's why he was the inspiration for the entire contraceptive movement. He gets these things. He understands. He's been watching billions of us. For thousands of years, you think he doesn't kind of figure out human patterns after a while? He knows we all have the same nature that we had back in the garden. It worked then, it works now. So the danger here is many Catholics have this idea, that, and rightfully so, born out of a sense of goodness, good intention, that what we've got to do is like seize control of the Senate and seize control of the U.S. presidency and do all of these things and then we'll get everything the way we want it to be. That is a naive view. Because we did have control of the Senate and the presidency. And we got the deciding vote that secured and anchored abortion until the end of the world or the end of America. There is no way Roe v. Wade is ever going away. And as long as that is on the books, all kinds of mischief can happen around it. We can come up with 20 weeks here and this and that. But, you know, what are we doing at that point? When we get into that sort of legislative political mindset, we're playing in their sandbox. You go, knew that, you go near that incremental approach, and you've made the decision, these children can be killed. Now, of course, you've got the two ways of looking at it. Well, if you, well at least you're saving some of them but you're saving them because you are philosophically and politically signing the death warrants of these ones. We all go to the March for Life. Nellie Gray, God rest her soul, if her, if her cause for canonization doesn't begin in a couple of years, something's wrong with the church in America. No compromise. I sat and interviewed her on a couple of occasions, sat and had coffee with her. What a lovely, wonderful woman. No compromise because she understands where compromise goes. But in the great political understanding of things, well, that's what politicians do, isn't it? What well, is politics? It's the art of compromise. So you get some of what you want, I get some of what I want, I didn't get this, you didn't get that, but we're okay. That's what just came out of the Synod. Where's the clear statement out of the Synod? No holy communion for those in a state of mortal sin, period. Where is that? Where's that statement? Well, we had to compromise. Even the good guys will tell you, well, we had to compromise. The drafting committee on this statement was rigged. It was stacked. There were seven, uh, 10 guys on the drafting committee. Seven of them walked into there already publicly being on record, many of them multiple times, for saying, yep, all about communion for the divorced and remarried. Sure, absolutely. You've got to have a bunch of mercy. Came right out and said it. Worrell, Gracias, Du, uh, Forte. There's four of them. I can't remember the, uh, uh, the, the head of the Jesuits, Father Nicholas. And they're on the record going into the synod. Yep, we need to do this. There's 10 guys that write the final relatio. 
seven of them have already made their minds up before the bishops ever have their get-togethers. And just so you know, they produced the, the you know the Friday night they or sorry Thursday night they produced the draft, and it said exactly what they wanted it to say. They gave it into the bishops' hall. They tore it apart. They had 51 bishops stand up and object, and they ran. There would have been more, but they ran out of time. The clock just ran out. 51 bishops stood up and offered 1,355 objections to what these seven men had crafted. They took it back, wrote, a, wrote again on Friday night. They brought it into the hall, and they, what did you get? You got a politically compromised document, where at the end of the day, one side says it's one, it won, and the other side said it's won. And that's it. Politics and compromise are not Catholic. They never were Catholic. Our Lord didn't bargain things away with the Pharisees. Now, we need to understand on the political level, I'm not saying don't vote, I'm not saying any of that, but I am going to pose a few questions here, just for thought. In all of the time that good, well-meaning, hope-filled Catholics have invested in trying to move the political machinery in this country to produce a moral outcome on these kinds of questions, abortion, gay marriage, contraception, uh, sex education in schools, on and on and on. How successful, first of all, how successful have we been? And we're talking going on 50 years now. Number two, what if that same energy, which is what, probably tens of millions, hundreds of millions of man hours, had been spent on trying to convert to the one true faith your friends and neighbors. See, politics doesn't dictate culture. Politics is the expression of what the culture wants. A nation isn't led around by politics. Politics is just sort of the breath of what the culture wants. Why do we have abortion? Because People don't care. That's why. You've got a group over here, and you know, look at every one of these polls, all every one of these surveys, nothing hardly ever moves. You have somewhere around 21, 19 to 21% of people saying, absolutely no abortion under any circumstances, forget it, never. Never a case. And then you've got about 16 to 17% over here on the other side saying, abortion, free candy, anything you want, for it doesn't matter. And then you got this big group in the middle who don't care. Yeah, they have an opinion about it. Well, I, mean, I would never get an abortion. And I guess, you know, the majority of Americans think abortion is murder. That was from a Pew Research study, 15, 2013, end of 2013. The majority of Americans think abortion is murder. Weigh this for a moment in your Catholic consciences. They think it's murder, and they accept it. You think you're going to change a law or change people by passing a law? It's not going to happen. You need to change the culture. And the culture isn't a thing out there, some big granite block. The culture is your brother, your daughter, your husband, your uncle, your children. That's your culture. Nobody can stand up and speak to the culture. There is no the culture. It's a concept to explain the aggregate of the people that you know in your individual circles across the board, across the whole country. Why? I don't think you would take a poll. I don't know if there's ever been a poll that I've seen uh, or that I know of, but can you imagine if you took a poll and said uh, and asked the question, Americans, do you support pornography? I'm going to bet the majority of respondents would say no. Yeah, we have a political system that simply allows a few people to go ahead and do it. Why? Because there's no voice of the church in there. Because Church and state are separated. 
They shouldn't have anything to do with each other. That is a Freemasonic understanding of a culture. The church doesn't have armies. The church doesn't tax people. The church has no way to enforce the gospel, if you would use the word enforce, like the state has the power to enforce its mandate on people. At the end of the day, why do Americans have to go along with certain laws? Because you will be executed or put in jail. That's why. Because the state has the power of coercion over you. And so many Catholics, again, well-intentioned, good, you know, the, the uh, Roe v. Wade in 73 sort of changed this dynamic somewhat. It's like, now we've got to fight back against this. This was happening through the courts. We've got to recapture the Supreme Court. You will never recapture the Supreme Court because enough people don't care about this. Why? Because enough people don't care about God. That's why. They simply don't believe. So you're not going to get, you may have the circular argument that, oh, we should vote for, you know, candidate X pro-life because he's got a really good taxation policy and he'll get us jobs it just so happens that he's also pro-life but you can't stand out there going vote pro-life because you know some people are going to honk their horns when you're standing holding your signs on the uh in support standing holding your signs on the corner honk honk yeah yeah give you a thumbs up other people will give you another finger but at the end of the day a minority of the electorate is voting on this issue. They're voting on the idea of, I want a better job, I want lower taxes, I want this, you know, carbon greenhouse gases. Blah, blah. They don't care about human life. They don't care about sexual immorality because the vast majority of them are practicing that immorality. You're never going to get a law passed, ever, saying, contraception is evil and we're not going to do it. We're not going to allow it. Yet there was that law on the books in my lifetime, the Comstock laws. Those are never coming back. You can't ramrod them through, through secret parliamentary tricks in Congress, through little procedural things where you add it on to an agenda. It's not going to happen. Our goal as Catholics is not to save a culture is not to save a nation, is not to save an expression of, you know, red, white, and blue, and I get all misty-eyed and teary-eyed when I see some, you know, jet planes flying over with their, you know, red, white, and blue streaks coming out of their exhaust. My job as a Catholic, every Catholic's job is to save souls, and that's it. Now, that has to happen inside a particular set of circumstances and time and space and all of that, and we find ourselves in this one under the tyranny of Freemasonic democracy where our principles are uh, freedom, equality, and liberty, all directed at the good of man, as Pope Pius X said here, Pope St. Pius X said, with a view to nothing but this horizon, just this life, with never a view to the supernatural, with never a view to God is owed public worship. That's not just something nice that the state does. God is owed worship. It's the first commandment. And we have for so long been in this sandbox of, well, we have to kind of cooperate with the laws and this. Well, so, well let's see what we can do to try to get prayer reestablished in the public schools. But, why don't you talk to the people around you and convert them to the Catholic faith, the same people who keep voting these guys in? Our charge is to save souls from damnation. It is not to get a law passed. A law, which, by the way, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, can be overturned. The Comstock laws were the laws of this nation. No contraception. That whole thing was set up, rigged up with a combination of uh, behind-the-scenes work, setting up with an eye to Roe v. Wade. They waited for a case to come because the goal was abortion, but you couldn't get abortion in place, ensconced into the culture, until you got this contraception issue solved. That's why there was the explosion against Pope Paul VI and Humanae Vitae.
and he had to be torn down. And that encyclical had to be ripped up. This was all one big, huge thing. And Catholics in that same generation in America were so desperate to want to be good Americans that we did everything that we had to do to get along and you know, cooperate with our Protestant brothers and sisters. And I'll share a little story with you. I was at the March for Life. There was a very solid Catholic guy sitting next to me. He was sitting across from a uh, very well-credentialed uh, pro-life leader, a woman who is not Catholic. And he had a, I was witness to the conversation. I thought, dude, you get a Vortex card. He says to her, uh, uh, she said, yes, I read, uh, I read Humane Vitae. It makes all kinds of sense. It was a three-way conversation. It makes all kinds of sense. And he said, uh, and she said something. I don't remember what it was she said, but he went, are you Catholic? And she said, no. And he said, why aren't you Catholic? You understand and agree with Humane Vitae, and yet you're not Catholic? And she said, well, I don't really want to get into it. All that's important is that, you know, you Catholics and we Protestants are able to work together here to save babies. And what was his Catholic answer back to her, his Catholic response? He said, it doesn't matter how many babies you save if you go to hell. What a thoroughly Catholic answer. What's it? She, she got, she stormed away. She came back later after a couple of drinks. This was in a bar. <laughs> but uh, that's a thoroughly Catholic answer. You're here spinning your wheels trying to change the culture, and yet why do, you, why do you have to do this? Because the culture can't admit the truth of what the situation is, that this is evil, that this is diabolical, but we can't talk in those terms. We have sacrificed being able to talk in those terms, and we have reduced our discussion to the purely human, to the purely natural. And when you get into the purely natural, your way of, effacing, of affecting change has to be through politics. Where's the great campaign? Where are the 500,000 Catholics marching uh, in Washington, D.C., that God be honored, publicly honored, I'd be surprised if you got 5,000 people at that. Catholics, even good Catholics, Catholics who go to Mass every Sunday, would have some kind of like, mm, well, because I know good Protestant friends of mine, and they love Jesus. The problem with America is that it's not Catholic. And we Catholics have frittered away our responsibility to our brothers and sisters and we have put all of our eggs in the political basket. You don't save souls through politics. You change politics by converting a culture. It's an entire rethink of everything Catholics in America have thought for the last 50 plus years that I'm proposing. This cannot continue like this. I don't know if everything did start to change, if, there, if there'd be enough time left to do it. All you can hope is that the people who have experienced the results of the political change start to realize how horribly desperate they are spiritually inside and that the church is standing there as a, as a great beacon to come, you know, not the Statue of Liberty, but the church. That's what this should be. We need to understand ourselves this way. This is what we are. If you're in a state of grace, you are a temple of the Holy Trinity, and you are made that way so that you can bring souls to Christ, to the church, to the faith. Trying to do this through politics, ladies and gentlemen, I, I give you the track record. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Sacred heart of Jesus, sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.